Now. Ah, oh, okay. So, are you going to say anything? No. Yes. Wait. Uh, wait one second. That we have uh, enough people logged in, and and he will introduce you. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah, I can see now. It's oh my god, yeah. It's, a, it's a, <laughs> I mean, it's exploding like just like number of coronavirus cases in U.S. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Sorry, this was wrong. <laughs> okay, um, welcome everyone to this fifth episode of the Medinfra Discussions webinar series. I'm uh, Simone Deliberato, and together with uh, Vincenzo Giannini and Stefan Meyer, I will be your host today. Uh, just a few words of introduction. The MIDI webinar series aim to offer the different communities working on MIDI infrared nanophotonics uh, an opportunity to showcase results and foster collaborations. Uh, the series will continue until uh, the 16th of July before taking a summer break uh, and we will be back uh, after uh, the summer in September. In this fifth installment, we are honored to have uh, with us today Professor uh, Jacob Kurdin uh, of the Electrical Engineering Department at the John Hopkins University. Uh, Jacob is one of the greatest theoretical physicists working today on nanophotonics. Uh, he published or edited nine books, uh, more than uh, 340 papers uh, and 40 patents. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and of the Optical Society of America. Today he will talk uh, of his uh, energy approach for nanophotonics, which is, in my opinion, uh, one of the clearest perspectives uh, to understand the difference between different nanophotonic platforms. I hope uh, you will enjoy. Uh -huh. Some practical information before leaving uh, the virtual floor uh, uh, to Professor Kurgin. The talk will last uh, roughly uh, 45 minutes, uh, followed by time for questions. In order to ask questions uh, after the talk, you can uh, use the Q&A button of the Zoom interface. You can either just write voice, uh, I will unmute you and you will be able to ask your question. Or if you prefer, you can write your question in full in the Q&A box and I will read your question aloud. Please note uh, this webinar will be recorded and it could be shared online, including questions. Okay, I'm done. Uh, I let Jacob start his talk. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Simona. Thank you, Vincenzo and Stefan as well for organizing uh, seminars. And I am honored to, you know, broadcast my point of view. All right. So without much ado, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. So basically, the talk comes out from. Uh, the talk comes out from, uh, from a kind of long, almost decade-long work in plasmonics. Uh, I'm not going to talk about plasmonics too much today, but uh, I assume that everyone knows that uh, plasmonics, uh, the idea of plasmonics is, you know, concentrating, ability to concentrate electromagnetic field into small, into small volume, usually uh, which is sub-diffraction limit. And by doing and uh, simultaneously attain very large enhancement of uh, electric field, which is good for lots of lots of things, both linear and particularly nonlinear. So my problem is basically yes. So it can see it's been active field, and it, uh, so number of publication uh, grows up as I mentioned faster than the coronavirus spread in the United States, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, I can compare it only with uh, at that time with price of Bitcoin. And at the same time, the law there is not much uh, which happened in terms of laws. So basically, if you look at it, this is a lifetime of surface plasma, polariton, and silver, which is 10 femtosecond, which is electron electron scattering time, and it's been the same around for you know, 10,000 years which creates a problem and we need to address this problem. And that's where most of my research comes from. I mean, basically how to achieve, how to address this problem. Okay, so disclaimer. So this I will talk only, when I talk about different materials, I will concentrate on very, on, only on lowering the loss and improving field enhancement. 
and, and also emission efficiency in different nanostructures. I'm not going to talk about beta stability, availability, compatibility, and all other abilities which you can think about. Obviously, be obviously, you know, some of the structures are just easier to make than others, some are more stable than the other, and I'm not going to talk about it, right? Most of information is not really new, contained in the literature. This is just to me, I'm looking at it from a slightly different angle. Usual results may vary, don't try it at home. Usually, that's what they write on the packaging. Okay, repealing and replacing metals. So of course, as always, I'm inspired by my great leader in, in the great leader of our country, if not the Western world, for better or worse, probably for worse. So as he said, repeal and replace, right? So make plasmonic. So that's also his word. We will repeal metal and replace it with something terrific. What is, what is more terrific? He never said, but we'll try to see what is more terrific. Alternative, the other name, call it alternative facts about alternative materials. All right, so, so why do we need metal, first of all? I mean, why do, why do present, uh, presently people use plasmonics? Well, for most applications in plasmonics and metamaterials, we want to basically be diffraction limit. One way to address, I like to address diffraction limit. Diffraction limit uh, comes from what? Uh, uncertainty principle. If I write uncertainty principle for momentum, momentum and coordinate, and momentum is obviously related to wave vector, wave vector is related to lambda and delta k and lambda like this, I get this, which is basically diffraction, limit, give or take with a factor. So in, to, in a sense, diffraction limit, diffraction, diffraction limit is basically comes from uncertainty principle, if you can think about it. And once you look at it, you can see that you cannot violate it. Well, you cannot violate it, assuming one thing, well, assuming that n index is a real number. So what if n is not a real number, then I have no, then of course we're not in, not in a Hermitian, in a mission uh, <laughs> Hamiltonian anymore, but easier to say. So let's see, why do we, so just from that, you can see that maybe, maybe something will happen when index, when index is imaginary. What will happen, we cannot say, right? So, okay. So let's read the let's look at it from a different point of view. So let's look at energy balance in a mode. So this is a mode of a resonator at time C. So we have electric field. And of course, we usual dispersion relation between wave vector and omega. And, and, and the length is comparable to wavelength. So it's a normal resonator. So we have uh, energy. So energy inside, we have electric field. So the energy is this, right? The electric field. I will talking about now simple structure. So not dis no dispersion. And so just epsilon e square over two. And I call this energy is kind of potential related. What if my time shifts by quarter period? So now I have a cosine. Uh, now instead of electric field, I have magnetic field. And this is relation between electric and magnetic field and the, and the usual thing, right? And of course I get magnetic energy. Magnetic energy is equal to electric energy. And it could not be otherwise because uh, otherwise you would not be able to have self-sustaining oscillation. So basically what you have, you have a, a kinetic energy, ele electric energy, which is kind of potential energy. Then you have magnetic energy, which is kind of kinetic energy. And, you know, it, it goes back forth, back forth, sort of like pendulum or weight on a spring, right? So, and they have to be equal, absolute. If they're not equal, then of course you cannot, I mean, what it is actually, if you think about it, it's just Lagrangian, uh, derivation of uh, oscillations for Lagrangian, basically, in a popular way. Okay, so what happens if we actually try to squeeze our mode and it becomes smaller than lambda? Well, everything stays the same for electric field, for magnetic field, and now you have a, you run out of your integration, your authority. You integrate, so instead of integrating over a few lambdas, you integrate over this characteristic size A. Characteristic size A is less than lambda, 
and let's that's what I get this ratio. So magnetic energy obviously now is too small. So this is your static limit. We all know it. This is a static limit of uh, Maxwell equations. It's when when you when your dimensions are sub lambda, you basically don't have magnetic field. And so energy is no longer cannot be conserved. So in other words, you have electric energy here, but we cannot balance it with magnetic energy. So of course, that what will happen, the excess of this electric energy will just radiate out. And uh, the whole thing will decay. All right. Uh, so, and if you look at it, what's this? This is precise, this is a ratio, right? This, this parameter, and this is diffraction limit, of course, with coefficient, but this is diffraction limit. So that kind of explains diffraction limit from energy conservation. And that immediately gives us a way around it. How do we fool? So that's why I make, 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 a, make a point that electric energy is equivalent to potential energy, and magnetic energy is, an, is equivalent of kinetic energy. So if you cannot have mag magnetic energy, uh, why don't we have a real kinetic energy? So now if we put a conductor, and conductor of course has an Im imaginary index of refraction or at least large imaginary part of it. Uh, now, so here we have a dipole, we shift 90 degrees quarter period, so we have magnetic field, which is obviously not enough. But we also have this term, basically current. We have a current. So we have magnetic energy and we have additional energy. Additional energy is just kinetic energy of electrons, kinetic energy of electrons. This is my kinetic energy of electron. I can write it uh, like this. This is plasma frequency. This is frequency. What's important, you can see two things. First of all, you can see that, of course, now this kinetic energy depends on frequency because it relates to velocity. Of course, it depends on frequency. Second thing that, of course, uh, velo velocity being, uh, velocity being uh, proportional to current, the whole thing can be written like this with current square and whatever sits outside, we'll see what sits outside. That's just an inductance. And it's called kinetic inductance. So in other words, of course, what inductance mean for those who know, usually inductance is associated with magnetism and it comes from the fact, but generally speaking, inductance, all it means that uh, current is delayed relative to voltage. So current can be delayed because of course of magnetic field or uh, length rule, uh, but also it can be delayed simply because electrons have mass. So it takes time to accelerate them. And so we write it this way. So now we can restore our equilibrium like this. And uh, we get uh, uh, this result. So first of all, important thing. We can restore it, but because we have frequency dependence here, we can only do it for a certain frequency or a set of frequencies for different frequencies. And basically, once you find this frequency, that's precisely one of the modes of surface plasma polarity. That frequency, that's what it is. Again, this is just Lagrangian derivation using Lagrange, Lagrangian. You find this frequency. So to summarize, uh, when your structure is sub-wavelengths, the energy can oscillate back forth between electrical energy on one side uh, every quarter period, right, or half of the time, and half of the time it is magnetic and kinetic energy combined. Uh, but so, so success, uh, so that's a way, I mean, this is a principle of plasmonics. Right? That's how we can understand why you need free. So you do need free carriers or at least something that moves <laughs> and has kinetic and has kinetic energy. But uh, of course there is undoing here. The problem is if you have a, if you really sub, sub diffraction limit in all three dimensions. So that means that uh, kinetic energy dominates. So half of the time, all the energy, entire energy 
half of the time is stored in kinetic motion of carriers. And carriers scatter, there is no question. About it. Once it is there, it gets scattered. And unfortunately for uh, like, um, unfortunately for uh, metal, because you have a very large density of, density of states there, the rate is on the scale of tens, tens of femtosecond. And you get this result. So this is true sublink surface plasma polariton localized. And it's kind of related to propagating plasmon, surface plasmon polariton, because uh, you know sub diffraction limit simply means that you have very large wave number. Uh, wave vector is very large. It's it's the same thing. You get very large asymptotically. You always end up with a uh, with a, with the energy loss rate of the or, or, which is the same as a scattering inside the metal because field is inside the metal. Okay. Uh, this is very simple picture from a long time ago. I calculate effective scattering relative to scattering in a metal. This is for spleen ring resonator. And you see very interesting thing. So for when structure is truly sub wavelengths, uh, it's okay, don't pay attention to this. Uh, uh, don't pay attention to the, by the way, do you see my uh, pointer? Yeah, 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 my pointer. So this side is just intraband absorption where loss of metal is just enormous. So you never work there anyway. Uh, but here you get kind of a flat shelf, which basically that's what it means. You have scattering rate, which does not even depend on the wavelengths. And it does not depend much of the size of the resonator as long as it is significantly sub wavelength. But then at long free wavelengths, situation kind of gets better. Scattered, and that's important because here we're talking about uh, mid infrared. We're talking about mid infrared. Okay. So if you look at the boundary here, boundary depending is somewhere uh, right there, 10 micro, uh, between, uh, between uh, 10 and around 10 micro. So from this point of view, this is basically a kind of sort of boundary between optics and electronics, not exactly. Uh, approaching okay so border this is border wavelength border wavelength is omega equal to gamma so gamma is 10 femtoseconds so that's uh, that uh, so 10 microns pretty pretty much there 20 microns uh electronics and car and conduct means okay so of course this is well known this is well known because if you look at practical, at any practical structure, we all know that like, I teach electrical engineering, beginning courses, we always like to show inductors. But in reality, if you need any high Q structure, like a device, like a filter or whatever, you, nobody, ever, nobody actually ever uses uh, inductor because inductor is lost. So what's used is a core, usually use, a, actually what you use usually is a mechanical resonator. It can be quartz or it can be a surface acoustic wave. Or it has to be large cavity, which is size of wavelength. Right, so the true sub wavelengths region, kinetic velocity, right. So, so what happens at low frequency? Well, at low frequency, if we write a Maxwell equation, now you can see two terms here. So if gamma, uh, so as long as gamma is much larger than omega, Look what happens if gamma is larger than omega, so long wavelengths. Now, instead of displacement current, we're actually going into conductivity current. So you can see right away frequency dependence disappeared. And low frequency current dominates, and magnetic field can be high enough to, to work. Well, of course, we know it. Look, I mean, if you look to 50, go to 50 hertz, you have a, a something like a, a transformer. Transformer, of course, is lossy, but the loss, the scale of loss there is not 10 femtosecond by far, much longer. So that's why basically metals may actually work in mid infrared. Okay, so now why people try to change that? So, well, metals are lossier than semiconductors, and it's very easy to understand why, because if you look at a simple Fermi golden rule, 
you have transition here. This is how metal absorbs. You go from light, you scattered electron goes from below Fermi level to above Fermi level. And the same with semiconductor. But of course, density of states here in a metal is maybe a order of magnitude higher than density of states in semiconductor, just because Fermi level is lower. And uh, of course, you cannot get to, to plasmonics in visible region with doped semiconductor because density of carriers is smaller. But it's a viable alternative. It's a viable alternative, right? Um, okay. So very quickly, this is what alternative to different material is. And if you look at it, this is a metals. Metal can go all the way to UV, but once you go to near in the infrared and terahertz, you have lots, lots, lots of different materials. Doped semiconductors, transparent conductive oxide, nitrides, and uh, they have lower, and their mobility is actually can be much higher than in the metal. Okay, so this is example. And they, they can get negative epsilon. Okay. This is typical materials which I use there. At least if you look at indium gallium arsenic, you can see that gamma is much less there than in the metal, better than even silver, definitely than gold. Okay. Now we're, what I want to look at it is how, the, so how does loss depend on wavelengths? So now it's a very, again, from the energy balance point of view, we look how it depends on wavelengths. So we have electrical energy balanced by magnetic and kinetic. So energy stored in magnetic field is this. And this energy is not dissipating, it's just a field. Field cannot dissipate. Energy stored in kinetic motion, that's what dissipates. You only get dissipation when your carriers are moving. That's, that's a mechanism. So very simply, we can write a ratio of gamma, if you, gamma if you, this is my effective decay rate, this is decay rate in the metal, and this is ratio. If you look at it a little in a little detail, you'll get very mundane result, R over L, resistance over inductance, where, uh, resistance over inductance, which is what it is, which is what it is for every, uh, uh, for every LC, RLC circuit. That's, a, that's your decay resistance. So we can see the wire or a pipe, either this or PX, and we get results. This is my kinetic inductance. So it depends, so kinetic inductance depend on, on two parameters, plasma frequency, plasma wavelengths, and characteristic dimension. So the smaller is characteristic dimension, the larger is kinetic inductance. Why? Because the smaller is dimension, uh, you have to move, you have to put uh, more care, you have to, you have fewer carriers. So to maintain the same current, the carriers have to move faster and they have a larger kinetic energy, basically. Magnetic inductance, of course, is frequency independent and actually it doesn't, it doesn't depend on cross section, only on lengths, lengths and length. So ratio of kinetic inductance to magnetic inductance can be written like this. And F is of order of one. So we have very simple result. And the result is very interesting. So the effective loss rate depends on the ratio between plasma wavelengths and characteristic dimensions. If you look at it, there is no wavelengths at which we operate here only plasma wavelength. And here is a very interesting result, right? So once we go to infrared, we can have, it. so the, for, for the metal, plasma wavelength is 140 nanometers for gold. So if we operate at five microns, we can have a structure which is, I don't know, one micron, which is definitely sub wavelengths, definitely sub wavelengths, but it's still large compared to plasma wavelengths. And then the loss is not going to be horrible. So that's a most important result. 
right? So basically, so the loss in middle, all you can, there are many ways to look at it. One way to look at it is that simply uh, electromagnetic field simply does not penetrate metal at low frequencies because uh, index of refraction is very large. What's important, it really does not matter whether your index of refraction is real or, or epsilon is real or imaginary. As long as it is very large, the light gets reflected. The light can get, can get reflect, reflects from, uh, from large real index, uh, real index or from large imaginary index. It does not matter. One way to look at it. Okay, so now I will talk about, that's important, my favorite graph. So what I brought here, loss. This is just for metal, for different fields. So this is frequency, one over lambda I like to use. And this is confinement, one over A. So A is a characteristic size. This is bisector, which is diffraction mean, more or less, A equal to lambda. This is plasma frequency, right? And this is one divided over lambda frequency. I cut the one you said. So we have this region, and this is omega equal to gamma. All right, so regions are this. Okay, let's look at it. So this is the region which is subway, which is obviously subway length. So right, so this is subway length. This is and uh, and frequent and frequencies and low frequency. It is subway length, low frequency. So this uh, region where, the, because omega less than gamma, conductivity current dominates, conductivity current of free carriers, this is the electronics, and in electronics, losses are not very large. This is opposite, this is photonics, optics, where B larger than lambda and high frequency. So now we're dominated by displacement current, or better call, I like to call it reactive because it can be Capacitor can be inductor, uh, and it's bound carriers, and it's optic. Okay, this is not a very interesting uh, region because there's nothing there. Okay, this is a region which is which is what is it, which I call metal optics. Metal optics is this. So where frequency is high, omega is larger than gamma dimensions we are below diffraction limit but we are larger than plasma wavelengths and that means that although we have a metal most of the field stays outside of the metal it's not inside the metal and alternatively you and you have magnetic field and the losses are not horrible finally this is plasmonics so plasmonics is when your real plasmonics is when your field is inside the metal and significant fraction of energy is contained in the motion of free carriers. Here we do have free carriers, but the fraction of, of energy inside the, with the carriers is small. So this is plasmonics, this is metal optics. So strictly speaking, even though normally this region is also people call, okay, plasmonics this, plasmonics that. From my point of view, from energy point of view, this is not really plasmonics. The metal serves here just essentially as a reflector. Just to, and the field stays outside of the metal and the losses are low. So this is, so the true plasmonic regime applies a significant part of energy is stored in motion of charge carriers. This is a low, this is a lossy region that should be avoided. So at lower frequencies, we have what I call it metal optics, nanoantenna, microwave, you can call it. And uh, that extends to all the way to terahertz. So where magnetic inductance domain, basically is dominated by magnetic inductance, it's relatively low loss, but, uh, but it would be wrong to call it plasmonics. It's, it's not really plasmonics because, the en because very small fraction of energy is contained. And if you look at propagating waves there, the, the wave vector is not uh, much different from the wave, wave, wave vector is not different from the wave vector in dielectric. It's not really small. But you can, you can squeeze below diffraction limit at least in one or two direct, in some direction. 
Okay, so this is a, to understand it as a following, what's the difference between plasmonics and optics? Mark that. So this is plasmonics. So I can write, what, this is my capacitor and my inductance is kinetic inductance now. I do LC, which is resonant frequency and I can see my resonant frequency, basically everything cancels out, only depends on plasma frequency with some factor for the shape. But frequency of surface plasma polariton is always plasma frequency, is always order of plasma frequency, lower than plasma frequency, but not, uh, but not by factor of 100. Right, so losses and losses high. Antenna, when A becomes larger than lambda P, this is my C, capacitance now becomes uh, something like that instead just uh, epsilon away. This is inductance, but is magnetic, is just magnetic inductance. And uh, this is what I get. So my frequency is A over C, which is basically lambda, effective lambda over two, that's all related. So now, so here, so the difference in plasmonics resonant frequency doesn't depend on, uh, on size, it depends on shape. Here it, dep it definitely depends on size, and the loss here is lower, and energy is inside the field. So in mid infrared, I, it's very important when when people like to talk about plasmonics in mid infrared, it's not really plasmonics, and that's why it works because it's not a real plasmonics for many cases. Invisible, it is plas invisible. There is no alternative. Invisible. Okay, this is a great man. Who, who said it first, or something like that. And I always thought he was wrong, actually he was right. You were. Okay. Simple example, if we compare metal and doped semiconductor, here is my uh, very simple example. This is metal, different shape. So I make it, uh, so I, here of course I change the shape. In order, to, if I want to change the resonant frequency for metal, I have to change. I can, I have to change shape for semiconductor, just density of carrier. So here I see, so basically this is my effective loss. So for like 100 nanometers, the effective loss in silver is equal to loss in silver. So it's like 10 cents second. As frequency gets lower, you can see my loss in the metal gets lower, 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 lower. This is gold, actually. And uh, in semiconductor, here I cannot get there because my plasma frequency is somewhere here, maximum. But uh, when I get here, notice, see what happens. Even though loss, of, loss in the metal is higher than loss in semiconductor, scattering rate. For for the res for the kind of a plasmon, you much better with a you much better with a, with metal than with semiconductor because field simply doesn't penetrate. Field simply doesn't penetrate. Nothing. Ah, this is just numerical calculation. Uh, we can tune resonance. This is uh, basically I, I want to go very quick through it. So this is how I tune resonant wavelengths by shape or by density. But the point of the matter is that field gets enhanced more in a gold road than the indium gallium arsenic sphere. Even though indium gallium arsenic has high mobility. Uh, to me, um, this is going back to electrical engineering 101. You look what the loss is, loss depends on resistance or conductivity. It does not depend. Mobility never enters it. It doesn't matter how high is your mobility, you also need to have lots of carriers. And if you don't have lots of carriers, the loss is high. So this is a loss I go through. I don't want to, I, I'll go through this quickly. It's very easy to understand the loss dependence on electron density. I have current density. This is magnetic field, magnetic field density and kinetic energy density. So you can see, uh, so this is effective loss. It's the same derivation as I did before, basically. 
So the problem, the, the, the key is here. Uh, the higher, uh, this ratio, uh, the, ra the, the ratio of this is magnetic and density, and this is kinetic density. So if we have high, so look at it this way. If we have high density, then uh, for the same current, we can have fewer elect. We have we have slower electrons. So the energy, kinetic energy, is proportional to square of velocity. Therefore, it's much better to have great many electrons which move relatively slow than one electron or two electrons or few electrons which move very fast. It's kind of almost intuitive. You kind of expect when electron starts moving very fast, it should start dissipating like crazy. So, for, so why don't we have many electrons so they move slower and support the same power? Right, uh, right. I want to go, this is quickly, the same thing, you don't want to dilute electrons. It's not a good idea because of either hyperbolic material or spoof plasma. Same thing, you, you want to have many of them. I will go very quickly. Uh, if I go, because I want to go to phonon. So this is gap plus mon, and it's the same picture. Uh, your loss depends only on, on the ratio between characteristic size and lamp. So you have a gap, the loss will become large when the size of the gap becomes uh, comparable to plasma wavelengths. So it's of course well known, if you go to terahertz, your terahertz waveguide is, has very low losses. It can be one micro. It can be one. It can be deeply sub wavelengths from the point of view of terahertz. Maybe it's one micron, but it's much larger than plasma wavelengths. And if you go to the field of quantum cascade lasers, that's how terahertz quantum cascade laser works. It uses metal waveguide. Numerical analysis. Okay, let's go very. So this is just a numerical analysis. It proves that it's true. It's much better to have metal waveguides and doped semiconductor waveguides. Okay, this is using phonon polariton. This is previous work. So lots of, so the point of the matter is, does it have to be, so this is dispersion of plasmon polariton. And the claim to fame of a phonon, that in a phonon your scattering rate is only picosecond versus pentasecond. So inverse. Uh, phonons don't scatter that well, don't worry, which is good. So this is, but the problem is that now instead, so instead of motion of, elect, of electrons, you have motion of charged ions, but, I, but now you have, uh, in a popular picture, you have a spring. For example, this is silicon carbide, two ions, and they connected by a spring. Spring, of course, is electrostatic attraction in the bond, but I show it as a spring. So electrons, have, so now you have two types of energies. So the ions have kinetic energy and they have pon potential energy. And that's how it oscillates. Potential, kinetic. Potential, kinetic. And what does it mean? So now this is, so when we actually get our polariton, we'll have this type of equilibrium. So before we have, electric field versus magnetic and kinetic but now we have this big one big guy this is potential energy and this actually kind of sort of creates a problem which on one hand obviously we can get my much higher q because gamma is less on the other hand so we can enhance energy very 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 well we can put a lot of we can excite resonantly phonon and phonon kind of will, will store a lot of energy, but that energy will not be in the form of electric field. And it will be in the form of potential energy of the spring, which actually is still electric, but it's inside the bond. So it's very difficult. So it is there, but you cannot access it. It's, of course, it's still, everything is electric, electrostatic, electrical energy. There's nothing else in the world other than electromagnetic field. And as long as we're not talking about gra gra gravity and uh, nuclear forces, of course, everything is electric field. 
uh, but this is kind of spring I call it inaccessible electric field you cannot really put your probe inside the bond if you can you you have a good enhancement that's true yeah so of course you have Rastralen. Uh, Rastralen is here where epsilon is negative kinetic energy and uh, here you have epsilon less than zero physically it means kinetic energy is too high and you cannot get balance so then you get uh, the structure and this is it right all right so uh, looks exactly like metal but you have a resonant frequency okay i mean when i say electron has a lot uh, ion has a lot of potential energy it simply comes from this right this is your energy electrical energy and this is just and of course near the resonance uh, the dispersion is very high so the reason you get actually if you, everyone knows this formula but the physical reason for this formula on the microscopic level why is it not just epsilon but this derivative it comes from it's actually addition but it comes from potential and kinetic energy near the resonance okay okay so here's my energy so my end for here let's do energy balance analysis all right so this is my oscillation of the dipole so let's go step by step by step so we have each time we change the time by quarter period which means we phase, change phase by 90 degrees i call it in phase and this is quadrature right in phase. so energy in in so let's look what we have in phase so here we have pure energy of the electric field pure energy of electric field is just this then we have potential energy of valence electrons actually this difference between dielectric constant minus one which is susceptible this is susceptibility of valence electrons this potential energy of valence electrons this is where energy is valence electrons move finally this is this and this is this is potential energy of ions which as you can see very resonant here here's your resonance next to phonon resonance okay three here we have kinetic energy of ion and magnetic hey, god and magnetic field so this is a and and from this energy balance i will show you 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 look at this and compare different structures and you can get lots of interesting results oh so first of all i can write my oscillation condition my in phase energy should be equal to quadrature energy this is average the quadrature energy, energy conservation formally i can write it like this if you look at this this is electric plus valence electrons this is magnetic this is potential this is kinetic okay these terms actually you have four solutions here for this there are four ways to do the solution if you think about it uh, this is a over dimension so first of all of course you can have uh, zero if epsilon is zero everything works this is just longitudinal optical phonon and that's not interesting because uh, it's not coupled to outside world actually phonon is a phonon you cannot couple it but it's just a phonon actually you have second solution when this term goes to infinity then you then it automatically this is transverse optical phonon which actually has no electric field but that's the solution transverse optical phonon when, uh, third solution okay this equal to z a equal to lambda over 2n order of magnitude that's a dielectric resonator and the fourth solution how to can how can this one be equal to that if this one is small okay that can be equal only if this term is zero so the integral integral of epsilon times e square over r is equal to zero where e of r is some kind of a you know electric field distribution and that's your polariton 
Phonon polariton or any other polariton, plasma polariton. If you look at it, you always have to combine positive and negative dielectric constant. And once you combine it in such a way that this integral is zero, actually you, you have a solution. And that solution will, get, will be exactly at the frequency of, so, of, of your polariton. This is a way to find the solution. It's probably not the best way to find the solution, but, but uh, I, actually in my paper, I show that it works. Okay, now my most important slide of today. So energy breakdown. So I compare four different structures. Not structures, I would say. Paradigms. This is my dielectric resonator, and I'm simply trying to use the fact that dielectric constant is large. So I'm operating maybe close to phonon resonance, but on a, where epsilon is still is positive. So my dimension should be, dimension is something like that, uh, but N is large. Let's look at the energy breakdown in phase. Uh, in phase, I have electric field. I have some, I, I have uh, valence electrons. It assumes susceptibility of, of electrons is five, six, seven. So usually it's high index. So you have, and I have potential energy of phonons. Yes. So actually, if I look at this sector, at this pizza slices, the yellow pizza slice, that's actually fraction of electric field. And then it immediately tells you how good is the structure for field enhancement. Actually, not that. Not that good, but kind of good. <laughs> I mean, basically, here I have quadrature. Here I have large magnetic field, and I have a small electric kinetic energy, very small. Uh, that actually this determines my Q factor, this the electric field. So this is dielectric cavity, and that's why basically people call it always magnetic mode. It is kind of magnetic because the epsilon, epsilon is very large. So relatively speaking, so magnetic field is, li is large compared to electric field relative to, say, vacuum. So actually magnetic energy is a dominant. Magnetic energy is much larger than energy of electric field because here most of the energy here you have valence electrons vibrating back force. Here you have ions vibrating back force. So Q is not very high. Q would have been high, except it's not very high because of radiation loss. You always have radiation loss. Although, you know, people try to, there are lots of work trying to limit it. Uh, that's when people use, you know, I don't know, bound state and continuum, anapole, and all of that. In principle, can be solved. Now my phonon polariton. Dimensions is very, are very small, a much lambda than n. But on this pie chart, this is a problem. Most of the energy, once I'm in the Vistralin region, I'm very close to resonance. Most of the energy is just ion vibration. And here it's also ion vibration. What you see here, this is potential energy of ions, this is kinetic energy of ions. Uh, Q is not very high, but relatively high to metal simply because phonons don't, don't scatter as much as electrons. Uh, but it's not great for it's, it's You can get relatively good Q, but you cannot enhance field that well. Because most of the energy, all you have is you have your spring oscillating by force by force. This is plasmon polariton. And, I, and since me, I'm, we're inside mid infrared, we're talking about dot semiconductor. So here you can see the ratio reversed completely. Very small, not enough carriers. Not, so very small magnetic field, very large kinetic energy. Q is very low. Q should be low on this side. But here we're OK, kind of, because now we don't have those phonons. There is no potential energy of phonons. So electric field is kind of stopped like this. But finally, we go to what I call metal optics. And here I just show you kind of some, some kind of a patch antenna, if you want to think about it. Well, 
This one has a la la large electric field because typically in the you typically feel as well, I don't know magnesium fluoride not a not a very high index of refraction and besides you actually look for field enhancement of, on the fringe here. So electric field energy is relatively good, right? And here we have magnetic and, and kinetic, and, and magnetic field energy is larger at the cost. The cost is actually, this, is, uh, this becomes uh, actually sort of uh, lambda over 2n, and it's not much sub, it's sub wavelengths, but mo not much sub wavelengths. So that's a story. So to summarize for phonons, we have two different ki kinds of Q. So in metal semiconductors, we have this uh, drew the formula, and Q is omega over gamma, which is the same as real to imagine an epsilon. It's the same. In the dielectric in the rest and region, this is what we have. Gamma is two orders of magnitude better. So we have one gamma. This is determines decay rate. And, and resonant line width, and that Im it improves by hell of a lot. This type Q. So in other words, you'll get very narrow resonance, which is good. But field enhancement actually is determined by this real of epsilon to imaginary of epsilon, which is something like this. So instead of omega, you get omega minus omega TO, which is much less, you're close to TO. So it's not that great. Okay. So here is comparison. Here I show that uh, uh, this is what plasmon with indium gallium arsenic, which is outright very not very good. So if I use silicon carbide phonon, I can get enhancement of the field. I get very narrow here, which is good. And I do get larger enhancement, but enhancement is like three, four times better not 80 times, still better. Same thing for propagating for, for, for non, uh, same idea. So if you have propagating polariton, so decay constant of same thing, look, it decays in time much slower, but in time. But unfortunately propagation uh, length is not much longer because it's a slow light because uh, uh, because dispersion is large, so group velocity is small. Still better. Okay. So the energy is stored permanently in the vibrations. That's why you move slow, but slow by definition. The energy just gets gets stuck. So this is improvement for propagating polariton, which is still improvement. There is no question about it. This is dispersion. You can get larger wave, uh, larger wave vector, and you get much better propagation. You get much propagation, better propagation length with this, but not hell of a lot. I mean, not enormous. Okay. Do we need a surface polariton? So basically, we can be here, or we can be on the other side, like polariton. Or we can simply use a go here, use a standard waveguide with large dielectric constant, large positive epsilon. So it's a guided wide bulk polariton, so you can get this wave. So actually, surprise, surprise, actually here it stops working. So uh, you can actually get better result, you can get better result uh, probably just by going to a waveguide close to resonance. You get larger propagation lengths. And until you go, until of course, when you become low confined. But this one, but this one, you cannot get a good one with low confinement. Eventually you cannot confine. Here you can confine always. So eventually you can get, okay. This is general thing, general calculation. And actually I will probably stop after that. Numerical. So here I compare four things. This is my polariton with silicon carbide 
this is dot semiconductor, this is a, some kind of metal surface with cylinders, and here is a, and here is patch antenna. Uh, basically, this is an enhancement. Okay, so phononic mode in silicon carbide, you see it's very narrow. It is very narrow, nice, but uh, enhancement is not that uh, 15. This is uh, this is photonic mode, which is uh, on the other side of resonance. Not very good because of radiation loss. Magnetic, essentially magnetic mode, radiative loss. That's a problem. Gallium arsenic, doped basically on this scale, almost does not enhance. And this is a patch antenna. And the patch antenna. Look at the uh, patch antenna. Metal or oh, not phononic? Metal photonic should be uh, okay. If you look at patch antenna, mean look, enhancement is always larger. The problem with resonant is almost non-existent. Metal can large scattering in metal, so the resonance is not that good. But enhancement is large. Intuitive, you think that the area is so large here is because you the area of the whole thing is so large because you have lots of electrons basically, on the, in a nutshell. So here I compare. So it's here is performance. So what I pull, what I show here, what I show here uh, on one side, I'll show you with uh, with things, circles. Uh, this is the maximum enhancement, and this is a line width. So phononic mode has a definitely narrowest line width and decent enhancement. So because it has narrow line width, of course you want to use it for sensors. It's very good for sensors which are based on index change or anything change. You just shift resonance. This is a, a strong enhancement, a good photonic more, uh, gallium arsenic. And, and the other one is met, this one is a metal photonic mode. And it offers strong enhancement, good for uh, that is probably good for fluorescence and absorption sensors. So conclusion is basically this was this is good and that is good. This is uh, uh, not this is not so good. As a waveguide, it's good, but with high in the magnetic mode, not as a sensor. Uh, unless you can so you solve the, unless you solve the problem of uh, radiative loss. Uh, uh, but these two kind of complement each other because basically, if you think about the sensors, uh, there are the sensors in which you know. Uh, your resonance gets shifted by change of index or change of imaginary part of index. And then you need a just narrow line width. A narrow line width comes from phono. Uh, but if you need a fluorescence sensor, but if you're talking now about fluorescence sensor or even a surface Raman, uh, then you need field enhancement. And you don't need resonance. You don't need a broader narrow resonance at all because resonance comes from the molecule itself, for example. So you don't need it. Uh, then probably metallic, st metallic structure is still the best. Okay, you can do lots of things, but I'm not going to talk about this. Um, uh, general comment I will make, G my general cautionary comment. Uh, it's very important that when you think about polariton, you can do lots of things and you can always uh, uh, beat diffraction limit and many other things in storage if you couple to something else. But when you couple to something else, uh, you you must realize that uh, something else is not a is it, it's polariton and the fraction of a uh, photon or electromagnetic wave. Or yeah, for those of us who knows polariton, Hopfield coefficient, <laughs> Hopfield coefficient, right? It can be very small. So you you enhance something, uh, but uh, but do you get? Uh, but you, it's no longer photon, because if you look at it this way, just my example. If you look at any cell phone, I mean, in any cell phone you have, uh, whenever you talk on a cell phone, everything goes through, everything goes through phonon, always, because that because you because the filter because you have a filter and filter is surface acoustic wave, so basically all your voice gets transferred. Uh, first, uh, of course, first it goes on, on the intermediate uh, frequency, but then it gets transferred 
in the in the in the surface acoustic, in acoustic waves and back. So you know, if you think about this acoustic wave, you can think. I mean, well, look, we, we can't find our uh, we can't find our, our and it's a tiny thing. So you can think, well, look, we can't find our electromagnetic wave in a, in a tiny volume. But in reality, it's not. It's not. It's no longer electromagnetic wave. It's acoustic wave. Of course, you can do it because wave vector is much larger. So it it has to be very. One has to be careful. Okay. Uh, and that advantage of free carriers was why you can never disregard the electrons because there is no potential because free carriers have no potential energy. So no matter what you do, half of energy basically still stays in the electric as electric field because it's cap uh, and uh, so it's always if you need a field enhancement, if you need field enhancement or equivalently going backward uh, radiative efficiency, you cannot really. You cannot really beat uh, uh, beat uh, uh, free carriers. Uh, it's okay. Oh, I will give you one, one talk. So because I talked a lot about um, uh, uh, very quickly, I talked a lot about uh, this potential energy. So potential energy. What is potential energy of the spring? Look, I mean spring. What you have here in reality, you have positive charge here, electron is around, or it can be electron and a bond. And actually, if you look inside, when you polarize, when you polarize this atom, electronic cloud, it's very easy to see that inside you have enhancement. The field immediately gets enhanced inside by Q, omega over gamma, whatever gamma decay rate. So actually inside this electronic cloud, when we polarize atom, just, we have a no, very large electric field. The problem is we cannot access this very large electric field. On the other hand, if you think about Doppler atoms and stuff like this, Doppler atom, if we talk about infrared, really far, farther in the infrared, uh, farther in the infrared, um, your dimensions become larger. And actually you have Doppler and you, you have Doppler so, uh, so you have uh, so some uh, Rydberg atoms. So Rydberg atoms, you have higher states. They're fairly large. They can be like few nanometers, and perhaps there you can you can get you can see this enhancement. That is actually very interesting. Maybe something similar can be observed inside quantum world. The point is that you always have huge fields. In a, whenever you have an oscillator, and you and you resonantly excite oscillators somewhere there inside you have enhancement of the field by a factor of q but it's always inside the beauty of plasmon and uh, it is that actually you also get it outside as well but if you could get inside that would be that would be a good thing all right so this is basically my conclusions uh which i will talk very quickly not all of them because i did not cover all everything so the best way to attain low-loss plasmonic device is to avoid plasmonic regime, definitely. And that's why in mid-infrared it's done automatically. You use metal in the, in, in the mid-infrared, and, and the farther you go from uh, in wavelengths, basically you're in a regime which I call metal optics, which is not really plasmonics. It's a metal optics. The field does not penetrate metal much, and the losses reasonable can be. Right. So. All other materials like dope semiconductors, ITO, it's basically they, they're always inferior from the point of view of enhancing field, uh, reducing loss. But you know, they can be perfectly okay for something else. I don't know. As maybe some nonlinear material, stuff like that. So I'm not talking about it. All right, it's not a good idea to use all kinds of uh, meta surfaces and spoof plasmons. It's better, better to use simple structure. You can use phonon and, or, or actually exciton as well. So you do get enhancement of, uh, you, you get nice narrow resonances. You have large confine, good confinement of energy, not so good in terms of field enhancement and to cell effect. And again, one big issue. So you can do many different things, but honestly, okay, maybe you can do combination, like a kind of like non-metallic, like phonon, 
cavity phonon uh, resonator combined with metal antenna can be interesting. But it's very important that uh, the farther in infrared you go, we go, the better metal looks. <laughs> so, so you can find, it's kind of, you know, cache 22. You cannot replace metal. There is, there is not color. You cannot come up with anything to replace metal in the visible and UV. You can come up with many things to replace metal in, uh, mid, in, in infrared and terahertz. But the problem is that the need to replace metal is not that acute because metal kind of works as well, reasonably well. But I'm sure, I mean, there's lots of things which uh, can be done. All right. I expected applause. I did not get applause. I know why. So, okay. What do we do? Uh, well, already uh, I and I'm sure so the public thank you for, uh, for this uh, really great talk. Very, very pedagogical. And now uh, we open the floor for questions. Just a quick reminder, either uh, you... Uh, write voice uh, and I unmute you and you can ask your question or you can write your question in full in the Q&A box uh, and I'll read it loud. Uh, if you decide to write your question uh, and if you want me to uh, read your name, write your name inside the question. Okay, any question? Well, it would. Well, now you will have to do it. No, no, we have them. No worries. Um, oh, what do so we have a question. I may miss a point here. Could I ask how to relate the epsilon larger than zero and the smaller than zero regions uh, in configuration around page 35 to the silicon carbide structure? Uh, oh. I should do this. From this equation, well, this is an integral. These two are actually equal. I wrote it because even this two, so don't pay attention to this two. A kind of cancel. So this is basically when you go through calculation. This is the kind of, this is a, a energy. Uh, half of the time you have this energy, the other half of the time you have that energy. So this has to be equal to that, except this one has this nasty point. Uh, nasty, uh, this one uh, has this uh, uh, multiplier. Of course, this only for this, assuming it's sub wavelengths. If it's not, if it's larger than wavelengths in resonance, then, then of course, instead of A, you just have lambda. That becomes one, uh, lambda of two. So you have to make this one equal to that one. So there are two ways to make it. You can either make epsilon equal to this. So, that, so if A is significantly less than lambda, then they can only be equal if this integral is equal to zero. And the only way this, uh, this uh, e integral can be equal to zero is to, uh, the only way uh, uh, for this integral to be equal to zero is either epsilon is equal to zero. Epsilon equal to zero, that's a low phonon. Or plasmon, same thing, right? If it's a, if it's a free, if it's a metal, it's just a, it's just a bulk plasmon. So yeah, that's the one solution. Not very good solution because you cannot access it. But, I, but the second solution is the integral is zero. So you need to have this integral equal to zero. So if this, it, 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 so the only way you can make this integral equal to zero, assuming that your E squared, if your e square is not zero, obviously, then you have to, to, to make it zero, epsilon has to be positive somewhere and has to be negative somewhere else. And when you integrate, you integrate to zero. So you all, and if you look at it, it's very easy, you can see, if you look like a surface polaritone, if it's a bulk plasmon, for example, bulk polaritone, then it, uh, sorry, not, not bulk, propagating, that's epsilon one plus epsilon two is equal to zero. And if it's a sphere, is epsilon one plus two epsilon two equal to zero, which is actually, for simple cases, that's what it becomes. But generally speaking, it's just just this integral. Um, are you waiting for the questions? I have two points for you. The first, uh, 
uh, one of your last slides, uh, uh, third to last, you, you show the, yeah, the field is confined inside the atom. Can you expand a bit? Because uh, it seems you have, uh, you have some specific idea of how to access that field. Yeah. Well, I don't have my specific idea. Well, is slide, you, so you told about something. No. Well, it's just, just, it's just you know, Lawrence uh, calculations. So you calculate. So I calculate what is my internal atomic force. Uh, uh, basically, that's what I, uh, if, you, if you go through derivations, so, so basically you find what's your displacement, your, your internal field is related to displacement, something like this. So this is your for, uh, force which acts on it. So at resonance, the electric field also, okay, so, okay. So you have a, a electron which uh, which is held in place by some electric field of the atom. When electrons start moving back and forth, obviously that field also oscillates with the same frequency. Uh, and you can easily to show that the ratio yeah, clear. that the ratio is this that it's related to external energy, external field exactly like this. So, which means uh, somewhere there inside uh, the deeper the better. Somewhere in, inside here, you have this field, which is huge because now we talk about atom, maybe your gamma is really small. So if I put now, if I somehow can put my, uh, uh, I don't know what, let's call it a probe. If I put probe there, uh then uh, i will see this and i can do exactly the same thing i can do in the rest i mean it's a uh, it's another type of resonant cavity basically yeah. the only problem is obvious what do i put there which is small enough but that's why i'm saying that uh, if i look at the uh, rydberg atom and i excite rydberg atom with mid with infrared then I actually can excite those states outer shell, really high energy state, which of course is, is large. And then maybe I can stick, and if that is large, uh, if that is large, maybe I can stick the uh, you know, small atom, which will see this field. Okay, thank you. Which probably will screw up the whole atom by, by yeah, it, is, it would be inter interesting also looking at your uh, very strong coupling works, understanding what, 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 does, what does the, this, the inbound state which, look like. Which by definition, will screw up my, my atom to begin with, but uh, still interesting. So it won't be like independent, the probe which does not disturb the, the thing itself. Of course, it will, but you know. So uh, that's, we have, yeah. uh, we have uh, our next question from uh, Bill Barnes. Uh, can you say I more mean, about uh, embedding one molecule inside another? Do you em envisage some kind of cascaded enhancement? Which I can. Yeah. Yeah, if you can. Uh, the question, it seems to me that enhancement is like, yeah, it's, it's more like a molecule. You have to be inside the bond. So yeah, it's on the scale of a bond. If I could, if I can put something, if I find some bond which is very large, which probably can be in a organic, and if I can put something there, yeah, uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I mean, inside the bo inside of the bond, uh, there has to be enhanced. I mean, yeah. Once your once your valence electrons start moving back forth, that's what it is. That's that means there is a strong field associated there, very strong. Uh, very strong field actually. Uh, question is uh, how do I get there? Yeah, yeah. So we can think about uh, electron and a bond. It's just another resonator. It is. Uh, it's just another resonator. Uh, next question: uh, Would a superconductor combine very high field enhancement because of free electrons with very high Q factor because of low losses? Yeah, uh, the answer is yes, but then we're back to my catch-22. <laughs> you have to be in terahertz, right? It's a superconductor is superconductor as long as it is below superconducting gap, which is terahertz. And uh, yeah, but 
my point is that there is no problem with terahertz metallic metal and terahertz works perfectly well. I mean, uh, for specific application, yeah. I mean, you know, people do superconductive circuits. So probably again, if you talk about, I, I think one application would be only for quantum, uh, for all kind of quantum things, because that is where you cannot afford to lose your one and only photon microwave. But otherwise, but the loss even in a in the loss for terahertz in a waveguide, in a, in, a, in like I don't think it's it's high enough. In, in just a normal strip 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 waveguide is not that bad for applications which are not quantum, what I'm trying to say, which, uh, which are not quantum, uh, metal seems to work. If it's quantum, yes, and that's what people do, of course, uh, because you cannot afford to lose one photon. Okay, uh, do we have any other question? If not, we have one. Uh, I just have a general question about the webinar. So it is possible to get uh, the slides of the various talks. Uh, this is a question for me, I guess. Uh, some of the, the uh, at some point we will uh, upload uh, the videos for the, uh, of, uh, of the talks, uh, probably in August. For the slides, uh, we will try to make the slides available, but for the moment, uh, I, we haven't arranged it yet. Any other question? No. Uh, okay, then uh, with this, we are done. Uh, I think we all can thank uh, Jacob again for thank the, for the great much. talk. Uh, we hope uh, you will be with us uh, next week. Uh, next week, we will have uh, Professor Andrea Alou, from the City University of New York, uh, who will tell us about his work on uh, mid-infrared uh, polaritonic metamaterials. Details of the talk uh, will be announced on my Twitter account uh, and on the event page uh, of uh, the webinar. And with this, uh, we thank uh, the speaker and uh, all the public uh, and uh, see you, or be with us uh, uh, in a week time. Bye. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, please. Thanks to you. It. Bye. Bye.